everyone. This is Joey Pusateri broadcasting from my home office with First Christian Church Disciples of Christ, and I bring you peace and grace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pick up our Bible study of the Gospel of Matthew. We are at chapter 13, verses 54 through 58, which reads as such. Coming to his, meaning Jesus's, hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get the wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary, and aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown and in his own house is a prophet without honor. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God and let us pray. Uh, God, we ask that you would be with us in this time as we study your word and discern your will and wisdom. We ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, in this passage, I think there's a few different levels or layers that we can identify here. So at the highest level, I think it's important just to notice uh, that Jesus is placed within the tradition of the prophets of Israel. So uh, Matthew goes to great lengths to place Jesus within that tradition, which is to say that he is one of the prophets, although he is greater than the prophets, but he uh, nonetheless stands in the tradition of uh, Isaiah and Ezekiel, of Jeremiah, of uh, Elijah and Elisha, uh, so on and so forth. And so being one of the prophets, um, he is going to experience the same things that the prophets experienced. And the prophets, of course, were uh, rejected, particularly by their own. And so Jesus also was rejected you know, by his own. And uh, I think there's a deeper layer that we can go into here. And I'm reminded of the parable of the Good Samaritan. So if you bear with me for just a moment, the Good Samaritan is a parable that Jesus tells in the Gospel of Luke. And in it, he's talking to some Pharisees, uh, or um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, he's talking to a lawyer, a, a, a teacher of the law, the text says. And the lawyer asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus turns it back on him, says, well, what does the law say? You know, you're the lawyer. And the man correctly replies, um, you know, to love God with all that you have and your neighbor is yourself. And then Jesus says, you got it, do that and you'll live. And then the man is looking to justify himself, meaning that he's not quite holding up to this um, command by God. And so he's looking for a loophole. And so he asked Jesus, uh, and who exactly is my neighbor? Looking to see where the loophole is in the definition of neighbor. And therefore, if he can pigeonhole all the people that he already loves into the definition of neighbor and exclude the people that he actively hates outside of that definition, then he'll be A-OK. -okay. And then Jesus replies with the parable of the Good Samaritan. So the parable of the Good Samaritan, if you're not familiar, a lot of people are, but just very briefly is the story of a man who is traveling down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and along the way he is attacked by robbers, he is beaten, stripped naked, and left for dead on the side of the road. And by chance, a priest and a Levite pass by uh, and do nothing. They go by on the other side of the road. And then a Samaritan passes by, and the Samaritan stops and helps him and puts him on his animal and takes him to an inn and treats his wounds there. And then uh, tells the innkeeper, you know, keep him, give him what he needs. When I pass back through, I'll pay whatever it takes. And then Jesus asks the question, so who was the neighbor of the man in the ditch? And the lawyer replies, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. So the point is um, that anyone who is, uh, anyone to whom you can extend compassion and mercy, which is basically anyone, uh, is your neighbor. And so uh, it is the act of compassion that makes somebody your neighbor and you are obligated to extend compassion to anyone who you can extend compassion to because those are your neighbors. Now, I don't want to go too far deep into that. I'm not examining that particular parable. But one of the things that has been pointed out to me or that I've noticed in the text is that usually, you know, we hear a message that tells us, you know, it's important for us to be neighbors to and to extend mercy to those who we otherwise don't like, you know, and uh, I think oftentimes a comparison will be made 
you know, between the Samaritan and the presumably Jewish man. And Samaritans and Jews would have hated one another. And, um, you know, to point to that great big difference and say, listen, you know, even those people that you hate are your neighbors. And it challenges us to think of people who are very, very different from us. So as a, uh, an American, you know, in the 21st century, I might be challenged to consider you know, people of other countries, nationalities, people who speak different languages, people who have different religions, people who have a uh, different background, you know, that these would all be my neighbors. And in fact, that is true because we're all human being despite all those distances and differences. But I think it's also important to notice that Samaritans and Jews, while they were very, very different in important ways, and because of that difference, they had a lot of uh, hostility between each other, that actually they were both Semitic people. Right, So they have some common ancestors. Uh, they presumably worship the same God, although in a different way, on a different mountain, and apparently that's a, a big deal to them. But they actually live right next to one another. And Samaria is the region that used to be a part of Israel you know, at, at some point in the past. And so it's also important to recognize that we are not only called to love our neighbors halfway across the world, but we're also called to love our neighbors who are literally our neighbors. And I think if we think it through, we recognize that sometimes those are the hardest neighbors to love. So um, it's easy, you know, for me to see somebody who is suffering in Africa or Asia or Europe or wherever and to have compassion for that person. And, and at times people will even write a check to a charity organization because they see somebody who is without food or water and their heartstrings are pulled and I'm grateful for that. And so they feel compelled to respond. Uh, I know that a lot of times people in churches will organize big mission trips to go to foreign countries, you know, to very distant lands in order to meet people who are different for them, you know, perhaps less uh, privileged as we are, and to serve them in some kind of way. And I think that that is wonderful. But we should not ignore the fact that we have neighbors, I mean, literal neighbors, people in our community who are in need and, and who stand to receive mercy from people that have the capacity to extend mercy. And I think that's very difficult for us. I think it's so much easier for us to love people halfway across the world than it is to love people on the other side of the railroad tracks, right? So why is that? Well, I think the reason is what we find in this text, that we have prejudice against the people that we are closest to. I'm sure we have prejudice against people you know, that we don't know very well, uh, that are, you know, again, halfway across, halfway across the world. Uh, but we have extraordinary prejudice against people, I think, that are within our communities that we deem to be different than us. So class differences. So one class of people might think of another class of people as being very snobbish and lazy. And then, you know, one class might think of another class as being, um, you know, ignorant or bigoted or whatever. And so we can have people in the same community that we believe things about. And because we believe things about them, we justify ourselves into treating them the way that we do. You know, so right now, obviously, at the time that I'm recording this, we have lots of political division. And the community that I live in in Danville has probably an equal number of Republicans and Democrats. And because there is so much um, hatred and there is so much prejudice stoked uh, among each people in each party against the other one that we all feel justified in thinking of them as our enemy, even though actually they are our neighbor. And uh, you can think of, you know, childhood friends, you know, for example, think about how when you see somebody for the first time in 20 or 30 years, how much they view you through the lens of the past of when they used to know you. And even though you're a different person and you're trying to present yourself as the person that you are today, they can't help but see you through the lens of who you were in high school or grade school or whatever. And, and then, you know, think about the times when you've been guilty of that, when you've encountered somebody that you haven't seen in 20 and 30 years, and you just can't get the person they used to be out of your mind. And you try to rekindle that connection based upon who you were a lifetime ago. It just doesn't work. And it comes at the expense of having true connections and being neighbors and extending love and compassion to those who are in need. Uh, so Jesus cannot 
be the person that he is. He cannot demonstrate that he is the son of God, that he is somebody who has come to you know, proclaim uh, God's kingdom among us and to heal those who are in need of healing because the people still see him through the lens of who he used to be. In other words, they have prejudices about who he is. And that leads to a situation where they are incapable of having the faith necessary for Jesus to perform the miracles that he performs. Okay, I've been talking for a while, so I need to stop, but I do wanna encourage you to be a neighbor to your neighbors. Uh, to remember that the people who are closest to you are sometimes those who suffer the most from your prejudices. And that in fact, it is important for us to put those prejudices aside and not see people through the lens of who they used to be or who we are told that they are or through our own past experiences with those people, but rather to see all of humanity fresh with fresh eyes each and every day so that the light of God that is within them can shine through. All right, take care. God bless and until next time.